John Lennon said from his hotel bed We're all Christ inside But we're Hitler too, he's inside of you It cannot be denied Cause we love the love, yet we give out hate We sing for peace and retaliate You a lover and a mother and a brother and a fighter too Jesus said the Mussolini All for time, Mahatma Gandhi Kissinger and Noam Chomsky Everyone's within you and me Hello, welcome to episode 68 of Glass Onion on John Lennon. And what you just heard there was a snatch of a song called John Lennon Said, which was written and performed by my guest today, Alan Parry, who, as mentioned at the end of the last episode, is a therapist, musician and a Liverpudlian, so an extremely welcome guest to Glass Onion. I'll play the full song at the end of today's show. Alan told me that it was inspired by a short film that you can see online called I Met the Walrus. It's a five-minute film and it details the occasion when a 14-year-old Beatles fan snuck into John Lennon's hotel room in Toronto in 1969 and managed to do an interview with him. And in fact, this film, which has got some wonderful animation to go along with the audio, was actually nominated for the 2008 Academy Award for Animated Short. I'll put it in the show notes, of course. So we'll get to the discussion in a second. I've just got a couple of other things to talk about. Now, Alan actually mentions at the beginning of the discussion the famous occasion of the young man called Claudio talking to John Lennon outside Tittenhouse Park in 1971, and we've talked about that many times, I think, on the show. And I thought that was a good excuse to get back in touch with Gavin Munro, who I contacted last month, about his film Finding Claudio. And Gavin's actually done an interview about the film and I'm going to put that in the show notes but what I'm going to play for you now is a clip from the film the clips that are online so far can be found on the YouTube channel Finding Claudio Film again I'll put it in the show notes and this is the wonderful Dan Richter who's been on the show a couple of times and the clip is called From Beat Poets to Summer of Love this is Dan being as eloquent as ever talking about those crazy days of the 60s so I will see you in a few minutes the whole drug subculture came out of the beat thing. And the beat thing was a small group of people who basically saw society as fucked up, you know, and stayed and ultra conservative and not much vision and no creativity. There's something about America that makes me shout with joy. It's a land of opportunity for every girl and boy. No respect for all different kinds of people and it was bad to black people and terrible to women and just wanted to go to war to make money for the munitions companies, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so they, the Beats has pretty much turned their back on society. We used to have, we had poetry readings all the time and we'd all get together and read our poetry and, you know, like that. And we do it in the back of bookshops and take dope and just let go and see what happens if we just experience life without limit. It's caught on. In June of 65, we had what we called the scene. And these were people who turned on. We all knew Allen Ginsberg and Gregory Corso and Larry Ferlinghetti. And, you know, and, you know, so everybody knew everybody because it was so small. It was a, a literary in a sense that it was built around the beat poets. You know, it, it sort of all went back to Columbia University and, and right after the war where Bill Burroughs and Allen Ginsberg and a couple other people were. Alan was writing, and they had met Kerouac, and he was writing, and it was a movement, but it was still very small. I was publishing a poetry review, and I was publishing Alan and Gregory, and, and he said, you know, it's amazing that I'm going on national news here in England tomorrow evening. And we said to him, said, well, Alan, if we can come up with a, an address and a place, and you can say it on television, announce that you're going to do this big reading, You'll reach millions of people, and maybe we can get more than 80 people at a reading. Or The next morning, we were looking for a place, and we were wandering around Chelsea area, and, and we went up to the Albert Memorial in Hyde Park, right across from the, the Royal Albert Hall, to smoke a joint, you know, and we're sitting there smoking this joint. 
And we're looking across at this gigantic Albert Hall that seats four and a half, five thousand people. See? And I said to Jill, you know, why don't we see if that's available? And she said, don't be daft, you know. I mean, you, you can't fill that up. And she, we were about to get married, and her parents had given her a check for a thousand pounds or so, something. You know, I don't. So anyway, we went over there, and they said, well, it just so happens it's available in ten nights from now. We we got a cancellation. It costs like eight hundred pounds or something like that. That would be a deposit of four hundred pounds. I just said, okay, we'll take it, you know. And uh, we gave them some money. And I went back and saw Alan and said, here, it's the Albert Hall. This is the date. We'll say uh, 8 o'clock, you know, and whatnot. So he went on television and said, we're going to have a be in, you know, everybody, you know, gathering of the, you know, the, you know. So I went back the next morning after the thing because we we're supposed to give them some more money. They said, you don't need to give us any money. We're almost sold out already. And we said, like, what? We turned away a couple thousand people. We realized this thing had metastasized. Tim was going around, you know, he's getting thrown out of Harvard, and uh, he and uh, Dick Alpert, who became uh, Ramdas, were getting thrown out of Harvard because they were they were turning they they were doing research and they were turning, you know, tune in, turn on, and drop out. So, bingo! It just exploded. A million kids all around the world getting high and dropping out and saying, "We don't want to have anything to do with this staid, fucked up society." We want to be free. We want to love each other. We want to get high and, and feel the changes happening and just, you know, get in touch. Hope you enjoyed that. And I'll keep you updated on the progress of the film Finding Claudio. There's a couple of other things. I rewatched recently the Spanish film Vivir es fácil con los ojos cerrados, which translates as living is easy with eyes closed, which is obviously a lyric from Strawberry Fields Forever. The film was made in 2013 and we did talk about it in episode 30 with Ed Chen where we were looking at all the depictions of John Lennon on film. Obviously if you're a Spanish speaker it would be easier to watch it but uh, I'm sure you'll be able to find some subtitles and in fact you can download subtitle files online. They usually line up but you, <laughs> you might have to trust that they line up with the audio. But anyway, definitely a, a good film for Beatles fans and in fact for anyone. If you would like to help out the show, I haven't asked for donations for ages. There is a link on the main SoundCloud page. I'm not going to pretend that it's a costly exercise with equipment and studios and things like that because it isn't, but it's more to do with time. I'm currently working two jobs and uh, this is ostensibly a hobby, but you know, if you can make any kind of donation, five, ten pounds, dollars, euros, that would be much appreciated it keeps me motivated to keep glass onion going all right so let's get to today's discussion so yes this is alan parry not the football commentator alan is spelled a-l-u-n the welsh way this is the second occasion in fact where i've had someone on the show who shares their name with a famous person the other one was david bedford who i met in uh, liverpool upstairs at the jacaranda in 2019 and we talked about that immediately that uh he gets uh, mistaken for the mustachioed long-distance runner who, of course, became famous again through those horrible 118 adverts that anyone who watches telly in England will have heard of. Anyway, so Alan is a therapist, but as with uh, Kirk Honda last year, episode 41, Alan took pains to say that he wasn't interested in diagnosing John Lennon. And in fact, Alan really isn't interested in putting labels on people because people are so different i think he explains that during the conversation but having said that there's still a psychological bent to the conversation but we talk about a range of topics we talk about the plastic on band and primal therapy period of john's life in 1970 one of the clips today is a few clips and one of them is a parody and i hope you recognize it when you hear it well recognize the fact that it's a parody it's something again i found online which i thought was quite amusing poking dental fun at um, John Lennon's views on genius. We talk about types of therapy, we talk about fame, we talk about band dynamics, and we talk about a few other things that I'm not going to spoil right now. Instead, I'm going to let you get on with listening, and I'll be back on the other side with a few words. Enjoy. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Glass Onion on John Lennon, and I'm delighted to have with me Alan Parry of the Liverpool Psychotherapy Practice that's at liverpoolpsychotherapy.co.uk. Alan, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me, Anthony. It's good to 
good to be on talking about the man himself. You're welcome, mate. And um, I have to say, you're the fourth Liverpudlian out of 70 shows, which is a terrible strike rate. <laughs> but uh, you've got some extra cachet because you are from Liverpool. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I can say any old nonsense and people will believe me. Yeah, that's it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're also a podcaster. So can you tell us about that? Because that's how I got to know you, in fact. Oh, OK, friend. yeah, I, I do a podcast called A Slice of Therapy. And the idea is just that you get little bits and bobs from a psychotherapist like me that might just help you through the day. Yeah, because I got to know you. I should give Mick Ord a quick mention because um, yeah. he's been on the show and he and I have actually done some okay. work together since. And uh, he sent me a link to your podcast a while ago and I started listening. And um, I think there's different types of podcasts, aren't there? There are people that go for the two, three hour ones yeah, and maybe bring them out every month or something like that. And then you've hit that niche of that nice length of, are they generally 20 minutes? Somewhere? Yeah, they're about anywhere between 10 and 20. I wanted to be quite bite-sized about it, really. Yeah, that's it. And are you still doing them daily or, or almost daily, I think? I was doing them daily for a long time, and I'm mm. doing them a little bit less often now. Now I've got that nice little library that people go and peruse, and I'm doing it more mm. as and when the fancy takes me. Yeah, I was originally doing this weekly and then, uh, you know, I had to modify yeah. my approach slightly because <laughs> yeah. I needed I think, a life. Well, I think as well, maybe putting them out every day, I was probably getting on people's nerves a little bit. Oh, God, here's another one, you know. <laughs> yeah, because you want people to subscribe and then they're going to get like, the, they're going to yeah. get them continuously on their computer. <laughs> then, yeah. All right, excellent. Yeah, so we traditionally start by asking people their um John Lennon origin story. So um, you're obviously from Liverpool. So yeah. what's your history with the Beatles and John Lennon? I kind of feel as though the Beatles were just part of the air. You know, my dad's mm. a massive Beatles fan. In fact, my dad's kind of a Beatlesologist. There's very little he doesn't seem to know about the Beatles. And mm. every time he has a birthday or a Christmas or something like that, it's trying to find a new Beatles book that he hasn't read. So my dad's mm. a huge fan. My mum's a Beatles fan as well. And it just seemed to be... I don't even recall a moment where I didn't know of the Beatles. I suppose in terms of John Lennon himself, I was always, uh, I was always impressed that him and McCartney wrote songs. That was a, a thing. Mm. But I think with John Lennon himself, I think there was something about him where he had something to say about the world. And I think maybe that's why I stuck to Lennon perhaps more than the, the other three lads. Yeah, it's such a thing, isn't it, with uh, with young men, you know, teenagers and young men. It's just so easy to gravitate to John Lennon. And um, what I found with this podcast and also having some engagement with social media, but in the last year I've almost stopped engaging in that apart from with my podcast. You know, obviously I'm sure you get this as well. Listeners send you messages and they want to engage you in conversations. So I'm happy to do that. But nowadays there's so much revisionism. You know, I've kind of learned that history is always in a state of revision. You know, yeah, it's yeah. never static. It's totally fluid. So over the last couple of years when I've been doing this podcast, it, it's gone through all the stages of, you know, John was a genius. Paul's a sort of commercial songwriter. No, actually, John Lennon's overrated. John Lennon was a wife beater. John Lennon was this. Paul McCartney was that. Paul McCartney's overexposed. And it just kind of goes through this yeah. whole thing. But um, one of the things we have discussed, and I think I'm going to get to later, is Obviously, there was a certain narrative after John Lennon died, and I think that was so strong, that sort of peacenik, rebellious. You know, It's because he ticks so many boxes, I think. That's, that's what makes him fascinating. You know, yeah, yeah, he's a complex guy, isn't he? I mean, you mentioned some of them. There are things about John that, that it's easy to dislike, mm. and there's things about John that it's easy to love, you know. I mean, I remember that as well. Like, you're talking about the origin story. I was... I'd probably been about nine years of age when he was killed. And I remember mm. that morning vividly, even now. You know, I remember the radio being on. I remember the disbelief and horror. Dad saying, like, Lennon's been shot. And it just seemed mm. crazy, you know. But it, yeah. And like you say, there's this narrative, isn't there, after he's died and stuff. But he was a human being, you know. Mm. And human beings, all of us are flawed in our own various ways. Yeah. But and like I say, there's a lot to... There's a lot to love about him, but there's there's stuff in there to wince a little bit about as well. In a way, he was unlike other celebrities because a lot of them tried to hide their bad parts. He almost did the opposite. You know, there's this yeah. famous interview that we've referenced so many times that he did in 1970, you know, the Rolling Stone. Yeah. And he actually exaggerated his bad points. That makes him quite <laughs> unique among... Well, his songs were like that too, weren't they? They were very kind of, this is me. You can get right into the guts of me. 
and uh, here it is kind of thing. There was no, um, I think sometimes, because I'm a songwriter myself, and sometimes when you get a little bit too raw, you can hide behind the prose, you can hide behind metaphors, and he never seemed to do that very often. He liked his nonsense wordplay, obviously, but he was very much, yeah, have a look, this is me. I'm always reminded of, um, there's a scene in the film, Imagine, where the guy comes, I think he's an Ascus at the time, yeah. and he's like, you know, you wrote these songs about me, and he's like, well, it's just a diary of me. How can, you know, it's about yeah. Yoko, or I went to the toilet this morning. He didn't put it yeah. in those terms. But, you know, he was very much an autobiographical, this is my pain, I'm going to put a tune to it, and here you go, kind of songwriter. And yeah. I, I think as well as part of why the Beatles were such a great mix, because McCartney is more of a beautiful songwriter mm. and Lennon is more of a kind of provides that cynical barb, doesn't he as well? And I think the yeah. blend of the two of them really works well. As a musician, you will understand this, that Paul McCartney's melodies in a way reflected his personality in that if you played his melodies on a piano, the range, you know, it'd be like one or yes. two octaves. Whereas John Lennon's trick was to use melodies that could be i don't know even like three or four notes i mean he famously yeah. used three blind mice for some of his songs <laughs> but he would just put these combination of chords and um i guess you've heard of pete shotten right his yeah his, yeah his good friend from school and he wrote a yeah. really good book in the 80s pete shot would describe uh, john lennon songwriting sessions and as we know john uh, did like the green stuff and uh, he would often be at home uh, with a joint on the go and Pete Shotton would talk about John Lennon sort of being at the piano. He's very fond of the descending bass thing. So you hold the same chord and then the bass goes. And Pete Shotton said, kind of with affection, he said, oh, part of John's genius was that he was kind of stoned and he would just let his fingers wander. And he would find... (laughs) he would find chords that would turn out to be like diminished sixth and things. Yeah. <laughs> it's brilliant. <laughs> but I think just being open to it. And one of my favorite John Lennon songwriting things is the fact that um, I think he was on LSD actually. And um, he heard outside of his house, a police siren going, nee, 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 and that's where he got the beginning of I am the walrus. Oh, okay. I just think, you know, the, the genius is in just allowing that to happen. I think, you know, yeah. not, not filtering it too much, you know? Yeah. Not blocking it. And I think that thing as well where there's a, a limited range of notes, I think that provides for that kind of guttural delivery, doesn't it? You know, like some, some of the stuff where he's talking about his own life later on, mm. that sense of just kind of churning up. Those kind of songs, a melody would get in the way. A melody mm. would, would rob it of its kind of pain. Mm. I'm wondering as a, as a therapist, what do you think of the Plastic Ono Band album? Is this like a mother and all that sort of stuff? Yeah. I mean, I, I like it. I mean, I th- it's, it's what I'm thinking about when I talk about um, the fact that he rips himself open and says, he oh, have yeah. a look. There's no hiding behind there, is it? It's like, you know, mother, you had me, I'd never had you. You know, I needed mm. you so bad. I remember going to a songwriting workshop, and I can't remember who, who led it now, but top songwriter. And in one of the exercises, uh, he was workshopping someone's song and they they couldn't quite finish it. And he says, you know, what's it about? What are you actually trying to say? Mm. And the person said what they were trying to say. And they said, like, have you put that in the song? Are those words actually in the song? And they were like, no. But Lennon had that in the song. You know, he had no doubt whatsoever what he was trying to say. And so, yeah, it's... um, it's interesting to listen to, I suppose, from a psychological point of view, mm. because he's doing that straightforward tracing back, isn't he? He's yeah. saying, like, this, this pain, this stuff that I struggle with now, you know, you don't even have to join the dots. I'm going to draw the line back to you. This is what I'm in yeah. pain about. But I think with that album, in a way, it has to be real to work, because yeah, if you think about songwriting, if, if someone wrote a song and said, oh, mother, you had me, I never had you, and had, like, you know, ten words in the whole song and three chords – it would be very easy for that song to just sound like a sort of beginner. Yeah. And I think a lot of songwriters, as you say, I I think they hide behind clever lyrics and things. Yeah. So I think in some ways, John Lennon perhaps wasn't always as authentic as the image would say. Yeah. The image would always say, you know, Paul was always oblique and hiding behind, you know, third person songs and John was always honest. And I don't think it's that cut and dried, but no, I think with that album, you know, he really, I mean, do you know, do you know much about primal therapy? Have you ever investigated that much or? It's not something I work with myself. Yeah. I know, I know kind of roughly what it is, but it's not something I've kind of deeply studied. 
Yeah, I mean, my sense of it is that they were all kind of locked up in a room and, and literally just screaming their pain out. Yeah, I think it was more that I think the screaming almost was, I suppose, like an inevitable conclusion. I mean, I read the primal scream, the actual book. Oh, OK. It's a long time ago. I don't remember. Yeah. All, but Yanov and his wife have both done interviews and stuff. And I think they said, yeah, you don't go in there to scream. But that but tends to happens. happen. Yeah. I think it's about um, getting in a state where you relive childhood trauma. But how would you, I mean, I don't know, I know you don't use that therapy, but how would a therapist get somebody to regress to being five years old? <laughs> Have you got any idea how that would happen? Or? To be honest, it's got quite, I'm not talking about primal scream itself now, but mm. these kind of regression type therapies, it's quite a tainted history, really. You know, there's people mm. like, um, Jackie Lee Schiff in the world of transactional analysis, for instance, who would regress people that she said suffered from schizophrenia so that they could regress to the age before the problem happened as she saw it. And there's other kind of regression therapies as well, where they actually would have people reborn, you know, there being of like a false womb and, and kind of people leaning on them. And both wow. of those have led to deaths, you know, and lots of abuses. I'm always very suspicious as a therapist myself where you take somebody to the point where they become very dependent upon somebody else. Everyone who I see, you know, no matter what distress they're going through, I don't feel a need to kind of regress somebody to the age of three, four, five years of age. Well, for a couple of reasons. First of all, you know, they know so much at the moment. But secondly, we all have imagination anyway. So if we need to kind of visualize something or touch upon something, I don't think you need to actually... And I'm not sure whether this is even what the primal therapy thing is, but if it is a regression yeah. therapy and, and you're actually taking somebody back so that mm. they are behaving as if they're like three or four years of age, it, it's got enough of a tainted history that it gives me concerns. You know, there's been deaths yeah. around some of the Jackie Lee Schiff stuff, um, some of the mm. other stuff. I think there's a, a young 10-year-old girl, Candace Newman or Candace Newmaker, and she died as well, you know, through this kind of rebirth therapy. It just seems uh, off-putting to me, really, that someone needs to to regress. Yeah, I mean, I do remember from the Primal Screen book, they said um, they wouldn't recommend primal therapy unless the person felt they had incredibly deep trauma. It's, you know, it's not your everyday therapy. Yeah. You go to a center and you have intense periods. And in fact, what happened with John Lennon was he did some primal therapy at Ascot. You know, he had the huge house, Tittenhurst. Yeah. And then he went to Los Angeles, and what happened was they were involved in a custody case with Kyoko and Yoko's ex-husband. Yeah. And what Yanov said was that basically they opened John Lennon up, but then he left before they put him back together again. So in a way, he almost did half the therapy, but it's almost ironic that that may be the reason why he got this amazing album out of it. Okay. And, and it's yeah. rather like, you know when the Beatles went to Rishikesh? Yeah. They were there to meditate, and they brought their guitars. And the fact that they were away from the press, probably away from drugs, uh, they may have snuck a, a bit of weed in there, but away from drink, and they had all this time where they're supposed to be meditating, and Paul and John couldn't stop writing songs, and George even berated <laughs> them and said, we're not here to write our next effing album. <laughs> but the, the conditions were so perfect because they had all this peace, and they were meditating you know, fairly diligently, yeah. I think. Yeah. As with John Lennon, you can imagine he went very hard on it for a while and then yeah. lost interest. <laughs> yeah. Rather like a child. He was very childlike as well, which I think is quite charming. And it comes back to another thing. Let me ask you another thing. What do you think about this sort of pain creates great art thing? Is that is that too much of a cliche? Is there anything in that? What do you think? It's a funny one, isn't it? Because, mm. like I say, I'm a songwriter as well. So before I was a therapist, I worked as a musician and as a songwriter. And... I don't write that many good songs when I'm happy. Right. <laughs> so there may be something to it. <laughs> so there might be something to it. I think what you're connecting with as an artist is some sort of current of intense emotion. Mm. I don't know. Happiness can be an intense emotion as well, but it tends to be kind of anger at injustice or it tends to be the pain of loneliness or hurt or whatever. These are the things that are, there's like stronger rivers to throw your boat in, basically, yeah, that's going to take yeah. you somewhere artistically. So yeah. I know just from my own individual experience, it feels like there's some truth to that. But at the same time, you know, you couldn't say that McCartney's not a genius. Mm. And yet McCartney seems a lot more centered 
you know, just in terms of his personal psychology, he seems a lot more centered. And yet you couldn't deny him the status of, I wouldn't anyway, the status of genius. So I think there is some truth to it. I think pain is going to give you normally a much more uh, powerful song. And I think of some of the songs that I really love outside of the Beatles, they do hit a current of pain, you know, like um, Mm. Iris the Men singing Easy's getting harder every day, you know, songs Mm. like that. Or Steve Earle singing My Old Friend the Blues. These are songs that get you in the gut. And they come from a place of pain. And I think that's part of art's function. I think art is a kind of therapy because it gives... It gives you an outlet for those painful feelings, whether that be painting or whether that be songwriting or music. Mm. And even if you've not written the song, to connect to a song which is kind of empathizes with the way that you feel in such a way that you can play it or listen to it or move to it or whether. Yeah. I think it's a therapy in itself. And yet at the same time, you're going to get these exceptions where it's possible to be a genius and still be pretty centered. People like me are aware of their genius, so-called, at ten, eight, nine. I always thought I was, why has nobody discovered me in school? Can they see that I'm cleverer than anybody in this school? That the teachers are stupid too? All they had was information which I didn't need to give me. I used to say to my auntie, you throw my poetry out. And you'll regret it when I'm famous. And she threw the bastard stuff out. I never forgave her for not treating me like a genius or whatever I was when I was a child. I think there's a couple of reasons why people gravitate to John Lennon. And I'll be honest, one of them is that he's not around. So there's a, yeah. there's a mystery. Yeah. It's like, you know, Jimi Hendrix died at 27. Yeah. Jimi Hendrix may have been a boring old man if he stayed alive, <laughs> but we're never going to know. Yeah. So we've always got that image of Jimi Hendrix looking amazing. And so Paul has rightly said, you know, people have a go at me for staying alive, you know, and that almost demeans him in people's eyes, which is unfair. But would you agree that if you listen to Paul McCartney's vocals, there's perhaps a bit more detachment than John Lennon? What do you think? Do they hit you in the gut, basically? It's a good point. They probably don't in the way that Lennon's guttural roar does. And I know he likes his rock and roll, doesn't he? Because, yeah, and he loves he loves wailing his rock and roll stuff. But you're talking about something different, aren't you? You're talking yeah. about that kind of inner pain stuff. The guttural scream kind of thing. Because he can scream long tall Sally, but that doesn't yes. that's not that's not it's a different. guttural scream. It's not a Kurt yeah. Cobain scream, you know? Yeah. I think I'd agree with you, but then it's not really his function, is it? You know, his mm. function is to go on these incredible melodic journeys. And there's something about a Paul McCartney song, his better songs that are just are just fantastic. But I think you make a good point. The delivery of a song is important, isn't it? It's like you listen to someone like Shane McGowan singing fairy tale in new york you don't really yeah. want anyone else to sing it even if they're a technically yeah. better singer yeah um, you need the drunken delivery yeah yeah the delivery is important and it's not yeah. about singing technique i think mccartney's voice by the way is remarkable i'm thinking through like even songs like let it be which was about his mum yeah that was lovely yeah they're beautiful aren't they but like you say they don't really convey the inner pain of it in the way that lennon would I think Let It Be possibly does. I mean, it's um, one of my guests who's on the show said it, called it a hymn to the world. So Yeah, it's very I like that, I like that description, yeah. I mean, he's got an amazing voice. I mean, I, I've always yeah. said that the thing I love about Lennon and McCartney is, to me, they're just totally equal because they have strengths and weaknesses. Yeah. And it's, it's beautiful, you know? Yeah. Uh, these narratives, uh, I imagine you've read some Beatles books. Which of the main Beatles books have you actually read? Like, Do you know what? I'm make not- a comment. I've not read a great deal of Beatles books, partly Mm. because 
And this is the truth. And anyone who, who knows me, dad, will tell you, you can't get through a conversation with me, dad, without him finding the most <laughs> tiniest little thread by which he yeah. can turn it into a Beatles story. So my dad reads the Beatles books and then just tells us all this kind of information. I have uh, listened to the Philip Norman book on Lennon. On oh, audio book. Book. Yeah, mm. yeah. I've not finished it. It's a big fat thing, isn't it? But Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, which books were you going to refer to? I mean, in terms of the narratives, Philip Norman wrote a book called Shout in okay. 1981. Yeah. And I'm still not clear whether the book was actually finished before John Lennon died. He must have been writing it before John Lennon died, but he, he essentially said John Lennon was three quarters of the Beatles. And he said okay. George and Ringo were basically irrelevant or as good as irrelevant. And he still says that about George Harrison now. Wow. Yeah. I mean, um, that's pretty harsh, isn't it? It's very I mean, harsh, even yeah. before you get onto McCartney, I think that's pretty harsh. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. And then Paul brought out a sort of semi-memoir. He wrote it with, um, have you ever heard of Barry Miles? He was the yeah. Indica bookshop, yeah. yeah. He wrote it with Barry Miles, who obviously knew him. And Paul, again, got criticised for apparently trying to rewrite history because what's emerged, and I think this is fairly well founded, is that actually Paul was the one who was into the avant-garde before John. Yeah, that's true, yeah. So he addressed a lot of the balance of shout. So there was a little bit of a kind of a war going on, a war of narratives. I think then, the problem that Paul's got right. is he's he's such a clearly pretty nice guy that people dismiss mm. him as boring. You know, so, like the thing with John, I love John, and John was always my guy. But if you, I, I always think, anyway, if I was in his company, I don't know how I would be. I'd be a little bit on edge, I think. Well, I think I'd be quite relaxed with Paul. He doesn't have the same sort of volatility. But like you say, he's been so experimental, and he was Absolutely. experimental and into the avant-garde, you know, before Lennon was. Absolutely, yeah. He's actually a lot more honest than people give him credit for, because I think the problem with Paul is that, and the, the guys who do the Paul McCartney podcast, they agree with this. He's got in a situation where he's so, he chooses to be so public all the time. Yeah. Uh, which wasn't the case actually in the 70s and 80s. He sort of emerged in the late 80s. And interviewers tend to sort of tee up these old stories, you know, oh, how did you write yesterday? And you know, he yeah. describes it. And you think, well, Paul could change that and say to the interviewer, well, well could you not ask me how I wrote Helter Skelter? You know? Yeah. <laughs> but it's when the interviewers sort of say it as if Paul's never told us about that. And he's been talking yeah. about it for 30 years. <laughs> so he's got saddled with this image of being a bit, uh, you're never quite going to get the truth. And I think maybe that's just a, a symptom of being Paul McCartney. You know, you, you can be open up to a point, but you're Paul McCartney for God's sake. There's a lot at stake, you know, as he's God getting God. older though, I noticed that he's, he seems a bit keen and doesn't need to make sure that his side of the story is, down there you know he's been doing a lot more yeah. interviews where he seems to be a lot more open than say he might have been 20 years ago i think really the thing that did count against him was when he tried to get the songwriting credits changed remember that to mccartney yeah. lennon it was only a few songs it was yesterday and a couple of others Do you know what though i'm, I'm on his side on that because it must be really difficult because like initially it was lennon and mccartney but then it kind of splits off doesn't it and some songs were just john and some songs were just paul yeah and it, it makes no sense to me. I mean, it, even if I was Lennon, I'd be like, I don't want to be on Yesterday because I didn't write it. I'd want to be credited for the songs I've written. Yeah, and so, yeah. like he says, you know, to have Lennon stroke McCartney, and I think the example Paul gives is, you know, with electronic stuff now, and it gets cut off after so many characters. It's like mm. Yesterday by John Lennon, stroke Lennon MC. And, yeah, yeah, Lennon Muck. <laughs> yeah. So I, I've got every sympathy, and I think really... You know, if he wrote the song, history should credit him as the songwriter. Mm. And I tend to think if Lennon was around, maybe he'd shrug his shoulders and say, well, yeah, I didn't do that. Yeah, it's possible, yeah. Yeah. Possible. I think, obviously, in the old days, they made the agreement and then it was a sort of contractual thing. But yeah, yeah. John Lennon used to tell stories. He'd, he'd go to a hotel and the, the hotel band would spot him and start playing, you know, da, da, da. not as a joke. <laughs> just, they thought it was Lennon McCartney. <laughs> Oh, John Lennon was on the, the Dick Cavett show in the early 70s. Yeah. And he was talking about, um, oh, yeah, I was in a restaurant today, and they started going, hey, Jude. Leave <laughs> <laughs> me alone. So, uh, yeah, they could make light of it at least. Yeah. <laughs> All right. 
I just want to make it clear to the listeners, because we, you and I discussed this, that you're not here to diagnose no. John Lennon. Dr. Kirk Honda came on the show last year, and he had a pretty good stab at it. He made it clear he wasn't diagnosing him, but he, he did talk about a few things. So um, if we could just talk about your therapeutic uh, practice, can you tell me about the type of therapy you do? I work a lot in trauma, actually. So there's a relatively new neuroscientific discovery from about 20 years ago called memory reconsolidation. And basically what that means is that even though I suppose therapists were doing it well in advance of the discovery, you can actually now erase trauma responses, the way the nervous system fires up in response to things in the now that resemble back then. You can now actually erase that like an old tape recorder, basically. And that was thought impossible before these discoveries. So I work a lot with trauma. And what I do is um, I try and trigger that memory reconsolidation so the Mm. trauma response is turned off. Because the benefit of that is you don't have to do any exercises to maintain it. And it relapses impossible simply because Mm. that old trauma program has literally been overwritten. Well, um, Alan, can I break the rules and ask you one question? Yeah, of course. John Lennon and trauma, yeah. Sorry. Uh, (laughs) Okay. You probably know that there's various narratives of uh, the 1980 John Lennon before he was killed, obviously. There's lots of different narratives that I've covered extensively on this show, by the way. Now, the most um, Lennon-friendly narrative is that essentially by the age of 40, he was back sort of madly in love with Yoko. He had a son, Sean, who he doted on. And in a way, his childhood demons had... (sighs) almost gone away now if you don't mind just speculating for a second is that possible that someone who, who'd had all those deaths in their life through the power of family life perhaps that, that those things could go away or, or are they likely just to always be there can these things be eradicated or is it just a case of improving your life they can be i mean that's what i was just talking about then like with memory reconsolidation these things can literally be erased so let's say, for instance, you've, uh, and I'm not saying this is what happened to John, because I don't, mm. you know, I never met John. Although people always think you have, because I'm from Liverpool, you know. <laughs> but yeah, I've never met John, I've never spoken to John, so I don't know what that is, but it's certainly possible. And mm. that's a big part of what I do. See, the way memory reconsolidation works is through a mismatch process. So your brain has this expectation and something else happens completely differently. So you can think of somebody, let's say someone's got an attachment style, and let's say their attachment style is insecure. So in a relationship, for instance, they might expect that relationship to end and they feel quite anxious and they're checking out the mood music. This is, mm-hmm. in a sense, you know, one of the various manifestations of some kind of psychological injury, I suppose, some sort of mm-hmm. trauma maybe. Let's say that person who is, say, typically anxiously attached, then has a relationship with someone who's very securely attached. And so all these expectations of being treated in a certain way just keep on happening differently. That person, you know, as we know, can then become securely attached themselves simply through the power of that interpersonal relationship. So the way that memory reconsolidation works is you get an expectation and then you get a mismatch and that that repeats And it's in that repetition, basically, that it overwrites the old trauma response. So it's certainly Mm. possible. I don't know whether it happened in John's case, but the reason I found that neuroscience discovery so exciting, because it means you don't have to manage your trauma anymore. Mm. You don't have to befriend your trauma. You don't have to do exercises. You don't suffer relapses. It can just be gone. Right, right. In terms of John, I don't know, you know, because the other way of doing it, and I'm talking about going inside of the brain, Mm. is if you're not overwriting the old pathway with something Mm. new, a healthier response, then the other way of doing it is you're creating a competing pathway. So you've got the trauma response on one team, and then on this other pathway, you're trying to build up another sort of healthy response. Mm. So that too might have happened to John. He might have been like, okay, I'm using this healthy response more and more. Then it's possible then in, in that model, because the trauma pathway still exists contained in the trauma responses that it could all just relapse again. So it depends, you know, I don't know how it was with John, but it's certainly possible so that Mm. we still remember it, but we have a different response to it. We don't have that kind of fight or flight response anymore or that sense of pain and hurt. 
Yeah, because what I was getting at was that I, I don't think apart from the primal therapy, John Lennon was actually ever in therapy. That's the thing. He, I don't think he ever had a, had a period where he was seeing a therapist. So right. all I was saying was that I'm, I'm just a bit skeptical of the idea that, you know, just having a son and everything could, you know, remove all those complexes he had. And obviously he went through drugs as well. I mean, he, yeah. again, I was talking about revisionism. What we're finding as time goes on and there's new Beatles research that, probably the end of his life again before before his demise was perhaps not as rosy as we we thought in in the past so yeah. yeah it's interesting and with yoko i mean i think yoko was quite highly traumatized as well again i've read loads about her and that's an interesting one actually so you're saying she was traumatized by his death or you're talking about no no i'm, by... I'm saying as a as a child she was oh i see Got yeah it. she had yeah. she had a history of trauma so again i mean i'm alan i'm using my phd in coffee table psychology here That'll um, do. <laughs> <laughs> what i see is their history was that they were you know two traumatized people also two artists who came together and i imagine they sparked each other off but then some books have speculated that they probably weren't helping each other ultimately because they're sort of playing out their trauma with each other i don't know Right. But, um, one it's interesting, interesting with Yoko, and this isn't a psychological point, but Yoko's a very controversial figure. A lot of people who love John don't love Yoko. I, I wonder what your take on this, really. I don't have a point of view necessarily myself, but just a hunch. Mm. I wonder, like many of the people who really go hard for John, is because he has something to say about the world. He's singing about himself, sure, but he's also singing about power to the people and give peace a chance peace. and imagine he's in his personal life, you know, he's donating money to activists and all this kind of stuff. Mm. And he's trying to be, uh, he's trying to be an activist. He's trying to be involved and he's trying to use his kind of celebrity. Like he says, as an advertisement for peace. I wonder if he would have gotten to that point without Yoko. It always strikes me that maybe Yoko was the politicizing influence on John Lennon, but you know, I wonder what your take on that is. My take on it is that, the way they sort of came together was that he was a rock and roller. He clearly had an avant-garde sensibility that was probably yeah. in there, but it hadn't been triggered. She, I mean, she was a pianist, but I don't think she had songwriting skills, but she had a, a gift for conceptual art. Yeah. You know, one of her famous ones was cut piece where yeah. she'd be on a stage and then the, the audience members are invited to cut pieces of her clothing off and yeah. she may or may not end up naked or not and that's kind of the audience's choice so yeah from my reading it seems like she was the one who was very good at creating events and um you were mentioning uh when the the, the homeless guy was outside is yes. talking to him yeah. i've actually had a guy on the show who was there next to john lennon at that oh, time because wow. he was, he was uh, their assistant for a couple of years okay and it was fascinating talking to him and uh, he kind of agreed with me that he, he said well, he said that they both had a genius for creating events out of often traumatic things because they, I don't know if you know, but they had a, they famously had a car crash in 1969 in Scotland. Right. John Lennon was a terrible driver, possibly the worst driver in the history of uh, driving, in fact. Okay. And, uh, uh, for some reason, he had decided, or the more cynical books say that Yoko had forced him to drive, or who knows. Anyway, he drove them in Scotland and, and he, they drove into a ditch and uh, had not terrible injuries, but quite, you know, it was a traumatic thing. And apparently, um, according to Dan Richter, who's this guy who was his assistant, they then had the car, the smashed up car outside their house as a kind of air quotes exhibit. Okay. <laughs> so, but I think John does credit Yoko for having that sort of conceptual idea. So I think possibly you're right. The peace thing probably came from well, I'm, her. I'm thinking less about the events and more about, like, was John Lennon politicized before Yoko? You know, you think of songs like uh, Woman is the N-Word of the World and some of the other statements that he made. Mm. Where does that come from? Where does John Lennon suddenly become this political figure? Well, I, th I think he always had a very keen sense of what was wrong with the world. And he was actually one of the, not to say one of the first, possibly one of the first celebrities to talk about Vietnam. And if you think about it in the context that the Beatles came to America in 1964 and you know what they looked like then, you know, the yeah. PR cardan sort of slightly feminine, you know, and within two years they'd gone from that to these sort of still mop tops, but you know, much more sort of shaggy hair kind of wearing whatever their clothes they wanted and talking about the Vietnam war. And you think yeah. 
that's two years. That's incredible. And also I, what I discovered from reading uh, Mark Lewison's recent book, amazing book, I read, uh, I went the full immersion. I went for the 1700 uh, page <laughs> author's version. Wow. Amazing journey, I must say. And I discovered that John Lennon was reading two books, which uh, I think are very important, which is 1984, uh, George Orwell, and then Brave New World, uh, yeah. Aldous Huxley. Yeah, yeah. And I was quite impressed that he was reading those. He also uh, this learned... This predates Yoko, does it? Oh, yeah. No, I'm talking yeah. about when he's a teenager. Yeah, when oh, he's okay. At, he was at Mendips, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And he also... Um, what's the other thing I was thinking? Yeah, he learned to read. His uncle taught him to read using the Liverpool Echo. So he was quite advanced in terms of words, but I think he was also quite advanced in terms of his awareness of the world. So I think he had a political bent in the sense of suspecting that something wasn't right with the world and suspecting that perhaps the media weren't telling him everything that was happening. So I think it was more sort of awareness. And I don't know exactly where the new left come from, but I suppose there's a connection with hippies and anti-war. I mean, that seems to ring true. Yeah. Um, but he was kind of giving money to communist groups and stuff like that, wasn't he? he? Well, and to the IRA as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's very strange with him because when, when you do read the sort of darker books, uh, there's a famous one by Albert Goldman you might have heard of. Yeah. You know, it was absolutely pilloried. Is that, when, is that reliable, though, the Albert Goldman one? It, was, it seemed a bit of a hit piece, didn't it? Funnily enough, I've just read the whole thing because I'm going to be appearing on a podcast talking about it. So okay. I went the whole 750 pages recently. It's got some actually really interesting psychological insights into John Lennon. It's got lots of inaccuracies, and it's essentially taking facts and giving you the worst version, whereas The the Polar Opposite, which is another book from the 80s, gives you the nice version. So yeah. it's not wholly reliable, but what's happening now is that books are being written about that period, which sort of take both strands and try and find a good middle ground. So I think the darker stuff, rather than being denied and being talked of as, you know, just character assassination. Pe yeah. People are accepting it more. I, I mean, I, there's a family link to the Beatles. And so I know just from that anecdotal source that he really did have a vicious streak in him. Mm. So my dad's dad died when my dad was eight. And so his mum would mm. work long hours. Right. And so his cousin was a guy called Richie Hughes. He was a drummer. And um, they changed his name to Richie Galvin. And the reason I'm mentioning him is because him and my dad basically were like brothers, you know, when they were growing up. My mm. dad would spend a, long, a lot of time with his family. And so Richie, when he grew up and became a young man, he was in all the bands in the cavern. So he's in Cy Tucker's band. He was in um, a band called Richie Galvin and the Galvanizers and stuff like that. And he was, he was very well known. He's passed away now. But his like, obituary was in The Independence by Spencer Lee. And, but Spencer says that he was actually asked to replace Pete Best. And I think there were quite a few drummers who were asked to re replace Pete Best, but they were actually in my dad's Uncle Richard's house trying to persuade him to, to join the Beatles. Mm. And Richie said no. And the reason why he said no was because he didn't like John Lennon. And the reason why he didn't like John Lennon is the ferries, you know, like the Royal Iris Ferry across the Mersey. Yeah. They used yeah, yeah. to have um, shows in there. That's right, yeah. And so yeah. Richie was on the bill at the same time as the Beatles, but before the Beatles mm. were massive. Mm. And he tells of this story whereby they're in the green room on the ship and there's a, a kind of female fan, young woman, and she has her fingers in the door. And Lennon yeah. spots this and kicks the door. And so there's Shit. blood all over the place. McCartney is like beside himself. Lennon thinks yeah. it's really funny. And Richie witnessed that. And I don't know if you can swear on this podcast. Go on, go for it. Um, but he said he was a vicious bastard. And so he, he just didn't like him. I mean, it, it might not have fitted anyway, because I think Richie was known as kind of like the Keith Moon of Liverpool. Yeah. So I think they might have clashed anyway. But there was that side to his personality, even as a, sure. a young man before they made it. So like I say, there's things that are easy not to like about yeah. John alongside yeah. all the other stuff, which make him very easy to love. Yeah, I mean, one of the things we've discussed on the podcast is um, basically John Lennon and alcohol. And um, I've talked a, a couple of times. Uh, I had a friend who was a, a bit like John Lennon. He lost a mother, first of all. He was very artistic. He wasn't interested at school. And, I mean, he was very like John Lennon because he was also a cartoonist. Oh, John yeah. Lennon was a pretty good sort yeah. of caricaturist. Yeah. And I, I remember them. we used to play music together. 
And I didn't know this guy very well. And he used to, he was right at the bottom of the class at school. And as a kid, you know, you kind of buy into that thing that all the intelligent people get the best marks and the people yeah. who get the worst marks must be stupid, which is yeah. clearly not true. And I remember going around his house and he showed me this little thing he'd created. And it was the, the history of the world in a, like a 10 page cartoon book. Oh, wow. And, uh, and this, this was a guy who got like, you know, 5% in his history exam. And I was thinking, how does he know about history? And he'd written like, you know, it's a sort of potted history. And I'm like, he's talking about the Vikings and the Saxons. Like, how does he yeah. know all this stuff? And I feel like John Lennon was a bit like that. He, he was quite precocious and he learned things. Well, he did little cartoon magazine stuff, didn't he? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah the yeah. Daily Howl. But what I was yeah. going to say about this friend I had, when he got drunk, he was a nightmare. He was terrible. It wasn't so much he got into fights, but he would sort of smash property and he was a bit of a vandal. And he would also start to sort of babble. He'd start to babble about his mother and stuff. And it was really uncomfortable. And we were close friends. And, uh, you know, I've, I've always been a, a fairly sympathetic person, I would say, and empathetic as well. And he would sometimes like verbally abuse people, exactly what we hear about John Lennon. And the thing was that, I don't know how to word this, but you can feel angry with this person. And this person needs to be responsible for their actions. But to me, I could see that beyond the point where he'd had like five drinks, he had almost zero control over what yeah. he was doing. And then the next, the next day he'd wake up and be full of remorse, but that cycle would just go, you know, he'd be full of remorse. Yeah. I'm never going to drink again. And then we'd go out and the same thing had happened. So I think with that story of the Royal Iris, I'm going to bet, you know, that John Lennon was probably drinking when he did that. And I think, um, is it a little bit too coffee table psychology to say that some of these demons come out more with alcohol than maybe with other drugs? What would you say about that? I think when, when people are under the influence of alcohol, the kind of things mm. that regulate them ordinarily are, right. are basically taken out, aren't they? So it's kind of like yeah. pure child, if you like, both yeah. the good and bad of that. Yeah. You know, some people get very sick. I mean, you only have to see this, don't you, on public transport. If you see a load of people on a night out, they look like a bunch of six-year-olds, don't they? Like all kind yeah. of being playful. And, but, yeah. So those regulating influences are kind of switched off. And... I think for some of us, those regulating influences are keeping certain certain hair parts of ourselves in check. Yeah, yeah. Just a comedic twist on that. You just reminded me of, um, I used to work in a bar, and um, there was more than one person, but there's one guy I remember, and he used to come in at like 8 o'clock, and he'd go, oh, hello, mate. You know, it was in London. Hello, yeah. mate, how you doing? A uh, pint of uh, Guinness or whatever. As he came to the bar and uh, he'd have a few drinks and, um, you know, two or three drinks, he's doing fine. By the end of the night, he wasn't a bad drunk. He was the opposite. He'd come to the bar like, um, you can't see this because it's audio, everybody. But, uh, <laughs> I can see. Sort of squinting <laughs> eyes, like his eyes half closing. And by the end, he's like slapping his coins on the bar and I have to c count the coins out and yeah. basically babying him, like exactly what you said. Yes. So yeah. That's yeah. the thing, yeah. It's nice to lose your inhibitions, but they, if you take that too far, yeah. you could end up like an infant. Of course, if you lose your inhibitions when those inhibitions are inhibiting something which, you know, you would normally, it's like anger and the kind mm. of vicious streak or whatever, then they'll come out then, won't they? Yeah. As you'll know, uh, John and Paul both lost, lost their yeah. mothers. Pretty similar age, actually. Yeah. I think Paul was 14, John was uh, 17, I think. And there's a theory, which I think is quite good, that they dealt with it in different ways in that John kind of said F off to the world, even though, you know, he obviously pursued fame. So he had to engage with the world and Paul decided to charm the world. I think that's a nice theory because I think you're right. Paul McCartney's generally a nice guy and I think he handles his fame quite well, but there's probably extremities to his personality. It just sort of comes out a different way, doesn't it? Yeah. I suppose this is the problem with fame, isn't it? You know, you're living mm. your life in a goldfish bowl. And all of us are flawed in some ways. All of us have got things that we would probably rather the entire world wouldn't see. Yeah. And yet from the age of very, very young, these, these people have lived their lives in that goldfish bowl with mm. everyone picking over and writing chapters and chapters and books and books about every step of their lives, basically. Yeah. So it feels unfair to say this, but, you know, I, I remember a thing with um, an interview with, with some of the people from Wings, who, for mm. instance, felt as though they weren't particularly looked after well financially yeah. uh, by Paul or whatever, which seems strange, doesn't it? Because he just left the Beatles. He must have been rolling in it. And yet well, these, they, these musicians seemed as though they were struggling, as though it was a band just starting off. 
Well, they were on a weekly wage. Yeah. yeah. It was Denny yeah. Sywell and uh, That's right. the other one was. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think the problem was that, yeah, in theory, Paul was very rich, but all their money was just tied up. So they, yeah, I mean, John managed to buy Sittenhurst Park when, they were, when he was apparently broke. So <laughs> I don't know if there's amazing <laughs> means, right? But yeah, it's, um, yeah, I think it just, yeah, it just comes out in different ways, doesn't it? But um, let's talk about fame, actually. I did, that's something I wanted to talk to you about. Not John Lennon specifically, but yeah. um, why do so many people who become famous, let's say famous rock stars, often end up either dead at 27 or a young age or in rehab? Is it because the pressures of fame? Is it because they're just given the keys to the kingdom and they can't handle it? Have, have you got any, anything you could tell us about that? It could be a number of things. I think fame is, is an appalling thing to go through, isn't it, really? Yeah. I know it's everyone's, well, not everyone's, but many people dream of being famous, you know, yeah. and all the acknowledgement you get. But you'd also get followed around by people with cameras. You get people rifling through your bins. You get yeah. people that you almost forgot you had ever had an association with going and talking to the press. And yeah. It must be a very, very psychologically damaging process to go through mm. and even to the extent you know i've heard i've heard mccartney talk about there is paul mccartney and then there's him it's yeah, almost yeah. like he is psychologically dissociated between yes. the public version and and himself as paul yeah. and i guess you'd have to do that but then it's a it's a psychologically challenging thing to do isn't it to mm. divide yourself in that way i think there's something that johnny marr talks about as well which is um he talks about the music industry, you know, always trying to create something from the centre. But he's saying, like, all the greats come from the fringes. And then the music industry just grabs them. The music industry itself doesn't really tend to create anything of great artistic value. It does come from the the fringes. And then if it's coming from the fringes, maybe, you know, we go back to that idea of something important is being said because people have been on a journey to find important things out. So maybe there's that element to it as well. I think also, I guess if you are going to kill yourself in an advertent way, having mm. a hell of a lot of money is only going to speed up the process, isn't it? Yeah. But I, I honestly think that celebrities are treated appallingly. And I know you mm. get this kind of thing, well, you know, they ask for it because they yeah. want to be in the public eye. But I don't think they do want to be in the public eye. I think they want to be in the public eye where they need to be for their work. But I don't think they want to be in the public eye generally. And I think once you lose the public perception, you know, where your sense of who you are and the world's sense of who you are becomes markedly different, I think that's very psychologically challenging as well. And it's very easy, I think, to lose your support networks. And it's easy to attract people who are maybe not there for your best intentions. You know, I'm thinking of people like Muhammad Ali, for instance, who was kind of ripped off by people who got close to him. Absolutely. I'm even thinking of people like, um, you know, I heard an interview recently with Paul Gascoigne, who got oh. his phone hacked. Now, this is yeah. quite a vulnerable guy who's got some problems with alcohol and stuff like that. And he lost his entire support system, like his family, because he would be telling a family member something on the phone. And he knew that they were the only people that he'd ever told. And it was on the front page of the newspaper. So naturally, he made the natural assumption that he was being betrayed by his own family members and cut them yeah. off. Wow. And obviously, it turns out that it was, uh, it was the newspapers hacking. Wow. So it's, it's not surprising, really, from, you know, when you, when you start from a position where maybe the greatest artists, like we said earlier on, are people who are coming not from the center of society, but from the fringes of society. Yeah, and that, yeah. that's the very thing that makes them our greatest teachers. And then they're put into a, an industry where people are picking over every flaw that they might have and yeah. coming to big judgments about them as well. I think it is a psychologically damaging thing. And I think perhaps we should be more protective of the privacy of people who are in the public yeah. eye. Fame cannot really accomplish what is asked of it. Every new famous person who disintegrates, breaks down in public or loses their mind is judged in isolation rather than being interpreted as a victim of an inevitable pattern within the pathology of fame. You want to be famous because you want people to like you. 
But the world isn't generally kind to the famous for very long, and the reason is basic. The success of any one person involves humiliation for lots of others. The celebrity of a few people will always contrast painfully with the obscurity of the many. Being famous upsets people. When we imagine fame, we forget that it's inextricably connected to being too visible in the eyes of some people, to bugging them unduly, to coming to be seen as the plausible cause of their humiliation, a symbol of how the world has treated them unfairly. Fame makes people more, not less vulnerable, because it throws them open to unlimited judgment. Everyone is wounded by a cruel assessment of their character or merit, but the famous have an added challenge in store. The assessments will come in from legions of people who would never dare to say to their faces what they can now express from the safety of the newspaper office or the screen. We know from our own lives that a nasty remark can take a day or two to process. Social media hasn't helped. It's made it far easier than before to be famous, and therefore, by necessity, far easier to be hated. A minor celebrity can now regularly face all the vitriol previously accorded only to Hollywood stars. Psychologically, the famous are, of course, the very last people on earth to be well-equipped to deal with what they're going through. After all, they only became famous because they were wounded, because they had thin skin, because they were, in some respects, a bit ill. And now, far from compensating them adequately for their disease, fame aggravates it exponentially. Strangers voice their negative opinions in detail, unable or simply unwilling to imagine that famous people bleed far more quickly than anyone else. They might even think the famous aren't listening, though one wouldn't become famous if one didn't suffer from a compulsion to listen too much. Every worse fear about oneself, that one's stupid, ugly, not worthy of existence, will daily be confirmed by strangers. One will be exposed to the fact that people one's never met, about whom one would have only goodwill, actively loathe one. One will learn that detestation of one's personality is, in some quarters, a badge of honour. Sometimes the attacks will be horribly insightful. At other times, they'll make no sense to anyone who really knows one. But the criticisms will lodge in people's minds nevertheless, and no lawyer, court case, or magician will ever be able to delete them. I think recognition is a nice thing up to a point. I mean, I've always thought that um, a great life would be to be you know, like a, a minor premiership footballer <laughs> because, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because you get fantastically rewarded and you're a little bit famous, yeah. but you're not, you know, the paparazzi are not interested in, you know, Fulham's left back. Yeah. But I bet he's yeah. doing very well for himself financially. Absolutely. Yeah. And this is the thing, isn't it? Like I was talking about all the nasty stuff, but it must be very difficult if you can't even go to the supermarket and mm. you always have to be on. Like I say, I'm a musician myself and, there's a, a, a person who was really big. He's passed now, unfortunately, in the folk world, a guy called Roy Bailey. And I remember he was performing at my, at my night. And so I picked him up downstairs as he got out the car. And I said, how are you doing? And he said, oh, I'm really tired. And he'd stayed over somewhere. And he said, I've had to be Roy Bailey all night. You know, he didn't have his, his hotel. He stayed over with people who were organizing the gig. And yeah. he liked it, you know, he loved being with the people who were doing that. But he couldn't be himself. He had to be the version of himself that the public wanted, if you know what I mean. So he, he had yeah. to stay on. And I think that's true of celebrity as well. You yeah. know, Paul McCartney can't just go for a walk down Church Street. He would be absolutely mobbed. And, yeah. and he'd have to be nice to everyone, even if he was having a really awful day. And yeah. it's hard, isn't it? It's a real emotional labor, that. Yeah, can I just say a story that I, I told recently on my other podcast about Darren Brown? Yeah. And I don't remember the details, but it, I read Darren Brown's book, and it was something like um, he was in a cafe or something. And um, I can't remember, but it's something like um, he got a phone call to say, oh, you know, you've got to get somewhere. Like he was late for an appointment or something. And so he rushed out the cafe, and just as he was rushing out the cafe, someone came in and said, oh, hi, Darren. And Darren Brown basically ignored him because he was he was basically out the door and there and this is pre-social media and darren brown said it's quite possible that person would tell all his mates yes oh i met that darren brown that bastard wouldn't even acknowledge me and then all those 10 people might the next day if they work in an office for example might tell everyone in the office my mate met darren brown and he bloody ignored him yeah it's this crazy world it really yeah. is bad and I, I think the beatles in a way were lucky lucky in one sense because I think the rise of the tabloids, you know, you can't even calculate what a difference that made to, yeah. to English society, yeah, the sun and everything. 
and I think the sun, I think it was launched in 69. I don't think about the sun much, by the way. Yeah. I try not to think about it at all. But I think the Beatles, they had the most extreme fame pre-tabloids, I would say, you know, along with Elvis and the Stones. But I think other celebrities had it a lot easier. I mean, I'm with you. I mean, nowadays it must be just, you know, I'm sure you get the rewards. And there's people like um, Noel but, Gallagher. Yeah. God, I was just going to say Noel Gallagher has sort of said in interviews, I-, I love being famous. I haven't had any downsides. Maybe at the beginning with Oasis. So I wonder whether, whether it's just luck that some people handle it better because you could say like stable home life, but he didn't have a stable home life either. You know, his father was yeah. hitting the kids and hitting his wife. So yeah, well, it's everyone's funny. different. And this is, this is part of the reason yeah. why I, I don't think diagnosis is useful, you know, because everybody is different. And even if yeah. everyone is given the same label, you know, they're all going to different places and they've all come from different places. But yeah, I'm thinking of, um, tabloids I'm, I'm sure a tabloid was was one of those who kind of uncovered the scandal that mccartney was smoking cannabis you've yeah. probably seen it yourself there's a stream of um newspaper men and cameramen and saying you know you're meant to be a role model and he's like well if you want me to be a role model why on earth did you print it have you seen this oh no that was lsd was that yeah. lsd was it yeah it was yeah, like yeah. summer 67 so was yeah. that a tabloid paper that got in for that I don't know, actually, because some of the papers that now are not considered tabloids possibly were in those days or vice versa. Right. I mean, I think there were obviously, you yeah. know, there were gossipy magazines, but I just don't. Th- Today's think, tabloids are slightly different. I think, you know, Murdoch just raised the bar. on That's the true. Yeah. Sleazy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, the word paparazzi comes from the Italian film La Dolce Vita, and that's early 60s. There's a okay. character called Paparazzo. So they obviously yeah. existed. You know, all this yeah. stuff has existed, but I just I just think there was a point probably in the 70s where it just got intensified. And Yeah, there was a bit more but, proprietary about it, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. Um, did you happen to see the Netflix documentary about Amy Winehouse? No, I haven't seen that, actually, right. no. No. I mean, it's very sad. I mean, I'm not sure if I'd recommend it. I mean, it's it's a, yeah. it's a very well-made documentary, but she's an interesting case because it's so shocking. Right? If you look on um, on YouTube, there's an interview she did with Jonathan Ross. I think it's 2004 okay. when her first album came out, and she was she was an attractive lady. She was quite chubby, very full in the face, and just full of full of the joys of probably just becoming slightly famous. You know, she hadn't taken off then, and I mean, when you look at the difference within i don't know three or four years famously you know never mind the buzzcocks that game show yeah she was famously on that and i think she was probably she was probably under the influence yeah on the, on the night well, there was a tour that she went on wasn't there that it, it seemed as though her handlers shouldn't really have put her on that tour should have looked after her a bit better absolutely i mean that that's been the case with so many people yeah. I mean, michael yeah. jackson just before he died was due to go on a punishing sort of 50 date tour but um, the thing I remember was that you'll probably remember that Amy Winehouse, there were a few shows yeah, in the couple of years before she died where she couldn't sing or, or she cancelled and walked yes, off. Yes, that's what I'm referring to, yeah. Oh, is that what you're trying to? Yeah, right, yeah, right. Yeah. But, of course, the crowd's natural reaction because they paid the money is to boo her. Yeah. And you're just thinking someone who's, un, you know, she was clearly under the influence, almost certainly heroin and alcohol. You know, it's pretty brutal. You know, you're not expecting the crowd to say, oh, you know, we feel really bad for you, Amy. You know, it's... So it's not to blame them, but, uh, you know, it's such a rough cycle when you get in that situation. It and, seemed and really the, exploitative, didn't it, when really she mm, needed some protection. Yeah. But I think someone like Paul McCartney has benefited, although he lost his mother. He said many times that the rest of his family was very stable. And he had, yeah. he, what he had was that he would say, you know, I had, I had uncles and aunties, you know, coming out the woodwork almost. Yeah. And they'd have these big family gatherings, and there was this big feeling of family warmth. Well, I saw a clip of that recently. He was playing the Royal Court in Liverpool for oh, several right. nights, and mm. one of them was just like a family get together. So behind mm. the scenes, he had all these aunties and uncles, and you know they're all keeping his feet on the ground basically. And I think BBC Look North was in there and and stuff. And he's like, "Yeah, it's just my family, you know. Yeah. To them, I'm just Paul." Yeah, that's it. Yeah, he looks like he's surrounded by a lot of love. Yeah, I suppose when you become famous, you need X amount of people who were your friends before you were famous. Yeah, And I I can't even imagine if you get to a point where you've perhaps alienated a lot of people through your behavior or whatever, and you get to a point where the only people that are around you are people that you didn't know before you were famous. I mean, Well, this is the thing with the Beatles, though. They kept a lot of scousers with them, didn't they? They went the whole way through. You know, like even with running Apple or whatever, 
used to be carrying their drumsticks on the bus and stuff. Yeah, I mean, they had that core, didn't they? So they had, obviously, Brian Epstein until he died, Derek yeah. Taylor, uh, yeah. Neil, Mal, Peter Brown. Yeah, and Tony yeah, Brownwell so, as well. Tony Brownwell, yeah, yeah. yeah. He wrote a good book, actually. Yeah, Quite gossipy, but <laughs> a good book. Yeah, I bought it recently for me dad, actually, yeah. Like I say, I'm just buying Beatles books, but I pass them straight over, yeah. Yeah. All right, just a couple more things, if you don't mind. Sure, yeah. Um, as a teacher, I've always been very interested in dynamics between people i tend to teach online now but i used to teach groups and it was fascinating that i would have groups where on the first day of the first class no one knew each other you'd immediately get this lovely warm atmosphere and it would just continue for the whole course and then i had other groups again that they didn't know each other and after three months they didn't know each other's name like i I would traditionally do these exercises where you got to learn people's names you got to have a chat with the person next to you yeah Um, this is english language classes I mean, dynamics are a fascinating thing. So what do you see as a Beatles dynamic? Just, you know, pure speculation. I think a big part say? of it is that bitter sweetness of, of the, the two leaders, you know, Lennon mm. and McCartney. That's the thing that always strikes me, both musically and in terms of personality. Mm. I'm always struck as well when you think of group dynamics of that story that you've probably heard when Ringo tried to quit the Beatles. Mm. So of course, Ringo was really the outsider. He'd not been to Hamburg with them and stuff. And he, he knocks on one of their doors, doesn't he? And says, you know, I think I'm going to quit because, like, you three are all close. That's and so the response was, well, I thought it was you three. I love it. <laughs> so, I mean, that speaks to something, I think, about ourselves, doesn't it? Almost like the human condition that in a group we fear that we're the one that the others don't like quite so much. Yeah. yeah. Have you been in bands? Or were you yeah. so? Yeah, oh, yeah, I've been in bands yeah. as well, yeah. Because yeah. that's fascinating. I mean, I concluded after a while that the, the problem with bands was nothing to do with the music generally. It was uh, balancing all these personalities. Yeah. Do you feel like maybe the Beatles worked partly because of Ringo, really? Because if you know Ringo's history, I mean, he was terribly ill as a child. Yeah. And on the anthology, he said something like, you know, I wasn't expected to survive past my whichever birthday. Yeah. And I'm still here. So in a way, he's sort of grateful for every day. Yeah. I, there's something, um, the, um, what's it called? Ron, Ron Howard is his name. Yeah, the yeah. film that he did. Yeah. Ringo comes out of that so well, doesn't he? Like you forget. Because <laughs> Ringo now, I don't know, I, I find him a little bit harder to take to because he seems a bit more pretentious maybe in his older years. But going back and seeing him as a kid in the mm. Beatles, and he's like a puppy dog with drumsticks, isn't he? Yeah, it's he just is, something yeah. very, very infectious about Ringo. And it comes yeah. across really well in, what was the film called? Eight, eight Days a Week? Eight Days it? a Week. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. There's something just in the footage from there that really fitted what the other lads were trying to do, I suppose. But yeah. well, what's your thing with Ringo? Where are you coming from thinking that Ringo was the, the linchpin there? Because you need this sort of solid base you need this guy who is um uh, you can almost say the most grateful to be in the band right um, i don't think ringo is a drummer who won the pools because i think he was a great drummer yeah yeah i, I think he was possibly the best drummer in liverpool and he had a, a sort of eccentricity that the beatles had but what i was saying was if you had perhaps a drummer who was as strong or dominant as the other three because i think george was quite a hard guy he went through a sort of spiritual phase yeah. as John Lennon did. But I think there was always quite a hardness to George. I think if you'd had a drummer who's perhaps as dominant, you know, and let's say even if you had a drummer who was also a songwriter, I mean, I, Ring, I know Ringo wrote a few songs, but, you know, I'm trying to think how, how long would the Beatles have lasted? It seems hard to imagine for me. I don't know. Yeah. You know? So his kind of, um, his gratitude and vibrancy and his... Almost. Almost his lack of competition, really. Well, like I say, he's yeah. like the puppy dog, isn't he? If you think yeah. of the other three of the family and he's the dog running around their feet sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, I see where you're coming from. There was a certain showmanship as well, I think, to Ringo. Mm. He didn't just sit there and play the drums, did he? You know, he was into it. His head was rocking. The mop top was going. Well, what was funny was that he, he was actually the most popular in of the four in America. Okay. He, he used to get way more fan mail than the others. Really? But I think... <laughs> In some way, I, I think they still didn't see him as a threat because Pete Shotton said in his book that John Lennon always saw Ringo as a, quote, second-class Beatle. I always liken it to having a second-class berth on the Orient Express. You know, it's still yeah. not bad, you know. It's still yeah. a good ride. <laughs> what, so why does he think he was a second-class Beatle? <laughs> because he wasn't a songwriter and he wasn't as interested as John and Paul in yeah. 
in John Lennon's quote, carving out the empire. Yeah. You know, so I think the trouble came with the Beatles. John and Paul, I think George Martin had a great analogy of two people tugging on a rope and smiling at each other. Yeah. <laughs> They're competitive, but they knew that they both sparked each other off and that yeah. they were better off being together. And I think Ringo, he just accepted that, you know, if you're going to be a band writing original songs, then clearly the, the guys writing the songs are pretty much the most important people. You could argue that, of course. Yeah. So I think the problem came with George. So what's your reading of George? I mean, what do you know about George Harrison? I mean, not loads. Obviously, I know that he put the money forward for life of Brian and stuff like that. And yeah. I always like that story, you know. Why did you yeah. give him so many million pounds? Well, yeah. I just wanted to see it, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But I remember when I was growing up and I was obviously being drip-fed the Beatles, he was probably the one I was least interested in. It's always fun to see him on YouTube clips and stuff. But I'm aware, for instance, that there was that big documentary about Harrison. I've not watched it. If that had been McCartney or Lennon, I'd have seen it a few times, you know. Yeah. So there's something about George that has kind of slipped under, under my radar. I don't know that you know this story, but I heard a story the other day about Phil Collins and George Harrison. Has this been covered Uh, before? No, no, I don't think so. So in his album, after he left the Beatles, that he did with Phil Spector. All things are fast. Yeah. (laughs) Phil Collins, and it's on that track, actually. Phil Collins was asked to come on and play the bongos. And he's a session musician. Mm -hmm. He's about 19. So he rushes over, you know, he gets the call. He's going to play with George Harrison. He does his session, it's finished. He waits like bated breath for the album to come out and he's not on the track, so he's not on the album and he's gutted. And life goes on and it becomes Phil Collins and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. But about 20 years later, they kind of meet each other at a party and they get chatting. And um, Phil Collins says to George, you know, uh, I don't know if you remember, but there was a young lad who came and played the bongos on that record and that happened to be me. So like, oh, okay, yeah. I said, is there any reason why it, it didn't go on the track? And he says, no, Phil probably just didn't like it or whatever. He said, but I've still got the master tapes if you'd like to, you know, maybe listen to it. Mm. So Phil Collins says, oh, that'd be fantastic. I'd love that, you know. He said, it'll all still be on there. So three weeks later, the master tapes arrive at Phil Collins' house, and he listens to the track, and the bongos on it are just abysmal. You know, they're utterly unlistenable. And right. he's, he's so embarrassed about listening back to how bad he was at the age of 19. And then he hears at the end of the track, you hear George Harrison saying, oh, and get rid of the lad on the bongos, he's shite. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, so he realises it's not Phil Spector, it was actually George Harrison. So anyway, George phones him up and said, I'm just checking to see that you got the master tapes okay. <laughs> and Phil Collins said, uh, yeah, I did. He said, did you listen to them yourself? He said, no, no. He said, I, I never got the time to. <laughs> and he said, oh, it, it wasn't Phil, actually. It was you. So George Harrison starts laughing. Mm. And he says, Phil, that wasn't the master tapes. He said, I wish I could have seen the look on your face. He said, what I did since our conversation, I hired a band <laughs> to re-record the track. Really? And it was George Harrison just smacking the bongos in any old fashion to wow. make it sound terrible. And then said at the end of this fake recording, get rid of the lad on the bongos, he's shite, just to wow. play a practical joke on Phil Collins. Now, that's a commitment to a joke that I think only a scouser. <laughs> yeah. So that's and like then, a verified thing, is it? Yeah. Apparently, yeah. And then wow. sent him the actual proper master tapes afterwards. Wow. But uh, apparently some of the musicians he hired were like top of the range, but he just, he wanted to play this joke, you know, so. so. I mean, when you've got lots of money and you, you've got lots of time, you, know, <laughs> you put the commitment into these kind of things, right, you know, yeah. Yeah. you know, he probably had all day that day to do. <laughs> so, uh, now, George is an interesting one because um, we're in a really rich era of sort of Beatles research, you know, in books and yeah. all these podcasts. And I mean, I don't really have time to listen to all the other ones, but. Certainly when they first came out, I listened to tons of them. And uh, like I was saying to you earlier, you know, with history, it's never static. You know, yeah, the events yeah. haven't actually changed, but they yeah. may as well have changed because our perception of them has changed. Yeah, yeah our interpretation. And, and, you know, little f- facts come out all the time. It's a psychological metaphor, that actually, isn't it? Oh, go on. Yeah, tell me. Yeah. <laughs> well, just, just that sense of, you know, yeah. like when you think in terms of your own life, you'll create a story out of the same 
facts. And yet That's right. what we tend to do is we'll create a constellation out of a whole night sky of stars. Mm. And so what's interesting there is which stars we're missing out so that we can mm. focus on this constellation. And then I suppose in Beatles research and in our own lives, we can start to tell different stories from the exact same data points. Mm. I think I listened to your episode where you were talking about constellations. Is that right? Oh, okay. Possibly, ah, I, see. Yeah. I do listen. I listen. <laughs> I've listened to tons of your shows. Yeah. Yeah. I've probably spoken about that. Yeah. Yeah. Often we will have a sense of ourselves like, um, oh, I can't do this or I'm this kind of person. And it's because we're only looking at a tiny slither of yeah. the data of our own lives. Yeah. And when we widen out, we say, oh, actually, I did do that. And I did do yeah. that as well. Oh, I am this kind of person because I yeah. did such and such and this mattered to me. And you can get a completely different sense of yourself and I yeah. suppose a different sense of the Beatles history as well. Yeah. I just bring in, in different ways of looking at the same data or even just bringing in different stories completely. Yeah. I mean, I've been through an incredible journey the last 10 years and partly through podcasts, actually. I mean, I, I just think they're such a wonderful thing. Yeah. When I was in Spain, I used to have to do a lot of traveling between English classes. Yeah. And, it, it, you know, I'm just learning all day, you know, it's yeah. just amazing. And reading books and listening to podcasts. It's just fantastic. And one of my many epiphanies was uh, I was listening to a guy uh, has a show similar to yours, actually, but it was a, it was a long time ago, it was five or six years ago. And he, and he did a, again, just a short po- podcast, 25 minutes about narratives. Okay. And, and he was saying that, you know, we are always telling each other now na- we're telling ourselves yeah. narratives. Yeah. I mean, it's not that facts don't exist, but, there's a really good TED talk by a fellow called Rory Sutherland. I'm, who's a, to, I'm writing do you know Rory? Yeah. 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 I, I am going to, I'm going to get that guy on my other podcast. Cause I love that guy. He's literally, I've just written his name down. Cause I thought I'll mention ah, Rory Sutherland in a second. You see, have you watched his TED talks or have you just heard? Yeah. And I saw, I saw one of his TED talks in person in Manchester and I've read his book as well. He's got a really excellent book out called oh, alchemy. Fantastic. That's yeah. right. Yeah. 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 Cause he's, he's done three TED talks. The story I love is the Eurostar story. You'll know that, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'll just tell the listeners because this is – I don't know how much money they were – they were going to spend billions of pounds. Was it improving the track? I make, think so. They were trying to make it faster or something, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. to make the journey shorter. Yeah. And Roy Sutherland said for about 0.1% of that cost, you could just get Wi-Fi on the train so people wouldn't want the journey to be shorter. Yeah. I mean, how can you argue with that? And then, of course, the, the joking one, he said, for about 10% of the cost, you could get male and female supermodels to give out free champagne for the entire duration of the journey. <laughs> anyway, uh, one of his talks was called Perspective is Everything. And the tagline was, I'm paraphrasing, but was it something like reality is not what it is, it's what we think it is or yeah, something like that. It's a bad Yeah, plan. I don't know the talk you're referring to there, actually. But, yeah. but and the reason why I was writing his name down is because he says something which I think is true is the we think that our conscious brain is like our executive, that that makes the decisions That's where it, yeah. in fact what happens is that we're making decisions for lots of subconscious reasons. That's and it. then that narrative part of the brain is almost like our public relations executive that tries to yeah. put a nice spin on it afterwards, tries to make yeah. sense of what was done as if there was some sort of conscious executive choice when really it was other things at play. Yeah, I mean, TED Talks are great because they're, they're, the, they're the sort of gift to the English teacher yeah. because there's nice sort of 15 to 20 minute talks and the students can watch them and then write some notes and then report back to me in the next class. Yeah. Another TED Talk is called, Are We in Control of Our Own Decisions? I don't know if you've seen that one. No. And it, it goes through all these um, cases where our decisions are determined by sort of external factors that can be planted there. You know, that's how a lot of advertising obviously works and... One of them is um, if you gave people the choice of uh, a holiday in Rome or a holiday in Paris, you might get 50-50 split. Yeah. But if you gave them the choice of a, a holiday in Rome, a holiday in Rome where the hotel won't give you coffee, so either adding something or taking something away, or a holiday in Paris, the holiday in Rome with coffee will suddenly seem more attractive. Yeah. And apparently when they did this research, more people went for that. There's so, lots yeah. of heuristics, isn't there, that we kind of, even when we know about the heuristics, we can't really help following them. They're like little sort of shortcuts, you know, so we're not wasting lots of energy trying to figure things out. We have these heuristics, but sometimes they have yeah. biases that work against us too. 
Yeah, I mean, just just one other one because this is quite funny. They were talking about kidney donations or organ donations in general. Yeah. And he showed this chart and it said um, countries that you expect to be similar, countries that are next to each other, like Holland and Belgium, you would expect their level of organ donation to be similar. But in fact, it was, uh, I don't remember which way around, but it was like um, 20% or something was Holland and Belgium was 80%. And he said, oh, do you know why? Because some of the surveys we gave out, you had to tick the box if you wanted to make an organ donation. And those were the ones with the low numbers. And the other ones was you had to tick the box if you didn't want to make an organ donation. Yeah. And because most people are too lazy to tick the box, they end up, yeah, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, you know, it, it sounded a little bit dubious, but uh, yeah, that was the point, you know. That, yeah. That I think extent. they've done this with pensions as well, haven't they? They've used the same heuristic to mm. have an opt out and it has big, big differences. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Okay, if you don't mind, there's one more thing I want to ask you about. What this were you going to say um, about George, by the way, just to back to oh, sorry. George Harrison? Sorry, yeah. what, one of the things that does interest me about him, and it's, it's probably a cliche thing to say, is he's such a fantastic songwriter, and yet he doesn't really start pushing his way forward onto albums until relatively mm. late, does he? Yeah, well, I think um, he had quite a few songs from about 66. Yeah. I mean, funnily enough, The Art of Dying, if you know that song from All Things Must Pass, he actually wrote that in 66. Okay. So, you know, imagining that on Revolver changes yeah. things a little bit. Yeah, yeah. That Martin Scorsese documentary, I mean, the footage was just amazing. I probably got a bit swept up in that. You know, it was this sort of crystal clear footage that we hadn't seen. But it, it was very much as you'd imagine, you know, spiritual George he didn't really talk about the other part, but what a lot of podcasts have found is that he's actually a little bit like John, you know, when George died, Paul said, Oh, you know, my baby brother died, but we kind of feel now a lot of us who study this a lot say that George was a bit more like John's baby brother. Okay. You know, cause he's a few years younger, but he had this interesting mix of spiritual George and sort of spiky George he had a bitter side and he could be a bit rude to people. I think with the Phil Collins thing, um, you could sort of read that a couple of ways. It's sort of a funny practical joke, or maybe he was in a funny way, almost trying to make Phil Collins feel bad sort of thing. I don't know. Yeah. I suppose I can see the scouse humor is a little bit put downish without being mean. Right. And so I suppose I'm looking at it through that filter, but you might be right, Mm. you know, well, one of the books I read, um, there was a lady from, I think she's from the Beatles fan club or something, and she stayed at Friar Park with uh, George. And she said there were three Georges. Some of the time he would be meditating and praying, and he just basically, he had to be away from people in his own spiritual space. Then there was just the lovely George, who would have a couple of drinks and you know, be the life and soul of the party. Yeah. And then there was a sort of, hard edge George and he did have a bit of a coke problem in the in the 70s that's so sort of one and off so it was interesting he would veer between party animal George and spiritual George in almost like in a Lennon-esque way he could almost <laughs> turn them on and off like a tap it's fascinating yeah and you can see the comparisons with Lennon there can't you actually vocally they were very similar I thought I remember listening as, as a youngster trying to figure out who was singing which track yeah. and would sometimes get you know, George mixed up and think, oh, this is Lennon, you know, and it wasn't. Right. Yeah. Well, George used to sing with a very, quite heavy Scouse accent. And uh, yeah. normally I'd demonstrate my Scouse accent, but I'm not going to when there's someone from Liverpool there. <laughs> no way. <laughs> not happening. Just things like, you know, saying the instead yeah. of there, just those kind of things. And his yeah. accent would come out in his music. Yeah. And his voice changed. You know, when you get to something and here comes the sun, he's got this lovely kind of gentle, quite gentle voice. Yeah. yeah. Leading on to my final point that I would like to talk about, this kind of a traditional thing I do on Glass Onion, what would John Lennon have done had he lived past 1980? Just pure speculation. I'll, I'll tell you what I think afterwards, yeah. but uh, go okay, for it. Okay, I'll give you a psychological <laughs> answer then. Go on, yeah, go for it. He would have done every single thing that I would have hoped that he would have done. Right. Every public pronouncement would have agreed with my opinion because <laughs> this is what we want from heroes, isn't it? You know? Yeah. So I know it's a bit of a stupid answer, but I think when you've got a hero who's died young, Hmm. I think one of the advantages that gives them is that you can speculate about the rest of their life and Hmm. have them completely without any kind of disappointment or blemish fit into your narrative of them. So like, for instance, 
everyone knows what John Lennon would have thought of Trump. Right. You know? yeah. Yeah. So like every John Lennon fan would think, oh, he, he would have hated Trump and he would have spoke out. And, you know, he probably would, but you don't know that. And had he have lived and would have been like a, a big Trump supporter, many of us would have been heartbroken about it. And so I think that's the answer. You know, it's not really so much had he have lived, but as he lives in our own hearts, we can shape John Lennon to be the John Lennon we need him to be. And it goes back to what I was talking about in terms of celebrity before. As a member of the public, you own that person to such an extent that you can just twist their memory in any way that kind of suits you. I mean, I would like to think that he would have been a happier John Lennon. Yeah. I would have liked to have seen him both be principled, but also at peace, you know, that the give peace a yeah. chance thing actually came into his own life, you know, and he got that level of uh, feeling settled and content. Yeah. I'd like to think he was still speaking about things that were important. I would have loved for him to have been making music again. I mean, he was making music again. He was, wasn't he? Yeah. yeah. He was due to tour in 81 as well. Yeah. So there's yeah. all, there's all of that. What kind of music he would have been making. I tend to think that the Beatles would have got back together. Really? Wow. You know, when you hear that story of him and uh, McCartney and his place in New York and the Saturday Night Live story. Yeah, yeah. And they're, they're kind of knocking it around. And yeah. you hear like that question comes up and it, it almost feels like everyone's ticked the box at a certain time in their life. Everyone has been open to it, but they've not all been open to it at the same time. Absolutely, yeah. I'm Lauren Michaels, the producer of Saturday Night. Right now we're being seen by approximately 22 million viewers. But please allow me, if I may, to address myself to four very special people. John, Paul, George, and Ringo, the Beatles. Hey, wake up. Uh, Lately yeah. there have been a lot of rumors to the that the four of yeah. you might be getting back together. That would be great. Not a chance. Walk, the Beatles are the best thing that ever about. happened to music. It goes even deeper than that. You're not just a musical group, you're a part of us. We grew up with you. For so this reason is. that I'm inviting you to come on our show. <laughs> now, we've heard and read a lot about personality and legal conflicts that might prevent you guys from reuniting. That's something which is what? out of my business. Personality conflict? You guys Listen, have to handle oh, that. But it's also been said that no one has yet to come up with enough money to satisfy you. Yeah. Well, if it's money you want, there's no problem here. The National Broadcasting Company has authorized me to offer you a certified check for three thousand dollars. Here it is. Can we can we uh, get a close up of this, Dave? With cameras on. In there. Now, here it is, as you can see. Very nicely, it is a check made out to you, the Beatles, for three thousand dollars. All you have to do is sing three Beatles tunes. She loves you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a thousand dollars right there. But if we don't want to say you know the you. words, it'll be easy. Like I said, this yeah. made out, this check yeah. here is made out to the yeah. Beatles. You can find it any way you want. If you want to give Ringo less, that's up to you. Oh, oh, man. Man. Oh, that's that's I'd rather not you love Ringo. I'm sincere about this. If it uh, helps you to reach a decision to reunite, well then it's a worth the investment. It's you a have worth agents? the investment. You know where I can be long. reached. Just think about it, okay? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and my sense is that they probably would have gone for it at some point had they have all stuck around i wonder if it would have happened for live aid or, yeah, maybe. Some, or even well live eight even if they had to wait yeah. that long but yeah you, you one day you know the fact well, that the beatles never got together does that actually help their legacy do you know how a footballer who's out injured for six so. months, they become a better player the longer that they're injured as the team struggles? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I wonder whether the Beatles, and it sounds a stupid thing to say to say they become an even better band, but there's that sense, isn't it, where they never ruin their legacy by getting Absolutely. together and doing a really lacklustre gig, you know? And I'm sure it wouldn't have been a lacklustre gig, but there's something about the fact that the Stones keep on going, which is just fantastic that they keep on going. Yeah. But there's also something where it's almost turned them into a bit of a cliche yeah. at the same time. Whereas the the Beatles had their moment and then that moment was gone and impossible to be recreated. And then oh. all we have is that moment and then it becomes kind of more precious for it. 
Wow, that is the best answer to that question I've had. I'm not just saying that, <laughs> honestly. Not that I don't value the answers I've had before. But, uh, and what you're saying about John Lennon, obviously he was 40 when he died. You know, yeah. someone, as we said earlier, Hendrix, you can do that even more because he's only 27. And I get the feeling Jimi Hendrix would have been a cool old guy, to be honest. Oh, God, I think yeah. he still would have been cool. But yeah. uh, <laughs> I don't know, maybe Jim Morrison or someone is a good example because... I'm a bit sceptical about what he would have done had he lived. I think that maybe that fire, not to use a cliche, but yeah, yeah. that fire burned bright for a few years. But um, it would have been interesting to see the anthology with the four of them. I think that oh, would have God, been yeah. really yeah. interesting. But you say they got back together. How long do you think that would have lasted? Could you actually see them as a regular working band again? No, I just think yeah. they probably would have done it for a laugh. You know, they would have done yeah. it for the kicks and giggles, really. They would have said, oh, should we just do this thing? Yeah. Not too heavy, but they maybe get together. Like you say, for a live aid or something like that. Yeah. Well, Although I can yeah. I can imagine John Lennon slagging that off. You know, I can imagine him taking a um, counter view. But that's what he was good at, yeah. wasn't he? He made you think. That's one of the things yeah. I really liked about Lennon. Like, have you seen the um, cartoon? Josh, somebody, what's the guy's name? He basically smuggled himself into uh, the hotel room when he was 14. Oh, no, I haven't, no. Uh, okay, I, I wrote a song called John Lennon Said. You sent it to me, didn't you? Yeah, well, it's yeah. based on that. There's a thing. Google it. It's called I Met the Walrus. And it's this oh, kid. Oh, yes, yes, yes. You've yes. met it, yeah. So yeah. He, he goes on, doesn't he, as an adult to be um, an animator, but he smuggles himself into John Lennon's room at 14, records right. this brief awkward interview in that short time lennon is saying loads of things that are challenging that are interesting that you wonder yeah. do you agree with this i think he would have continued to challenge in that way and even though even though you always want him to be the lennon that you need i don't think he would have been hmm. i think he would have been kicking you up the backside from time to time disappointing yeah. you from time to time and being the complicated thought-provoking guy that he was yeah, I just think he would have gone through various stages. I don't think he ever would have been a regular touring musician. I'd, yeah. Because it's weird. Actually, he only ever did one full-length concert as a solo performer. Well, yeah. he did He did the, the Rock and Roll Revival in 69, which is sort of with a pickup band. Yeah. Well, not a bad pickup band, though. <laughs> Eric Clapton, <laughs> Gus Foreman. Yeah. And then he did the Madison Square Garden concert in 72, yeah. and that's the only – he just did, like, brief performances, like activist events and things. The two that I'm – as certain as you can be, I, I think he would have been well into grunge. And I think when Nirvana appeared, he would have said, oh, you know, we were doing that in Hamburg, you know, 30 <laughs> years earlier. Because <laughs> that's what he said with punk, you know. <laughs> but I feel like him and Kurt Cobain, I think, the same way that, you know, Neil Young did an album with uh, Pearl Jam. Yeah. I think we might have seen something similar. I mean, I Like think, these collaborations and stuff. Yeah, Lennon and Nirvana would have been awesome. Yeah. And then I think he, I think he would have been interested in hip hop, but I like to think he wouldn't have actually tried it himself. But I think the activists uh, rap because rap has the advantage that you can speak rather than sing. Do you know, I could see him doing that. You know, when you could think you of something that, like, yeah? well, if you think of like, give me some truth. Yeah. It's not a rap, but there's no real melody to it. And he's just kind of spitting this stuff out. You can kind of see him. You know, maybe, maybe he would have been a bit too sensible to do it, but you can kind of, <laughs> I, I could see him kind of doing that, almost like a performance yeah. poetry type of thing. Yeah, but this thing we don't know, do we? We don't know what he would have done. I mean, he probably yeah. would have surprised us. It's just fun speculation, you know. Yeah. And the fact that we don't know everything is one of the things that keeps my kind of podcasts and all these books being written, because it's just, history yeah. is always changing. and it's. I mean, it's I've not read it myself, but my dad mentions something that he read where, Lennon had this wild idea that he would sail back into Liverpool. I don't know if you've come across that, but that would have been fantastic. Yeah. The idea of John Lennon on a boat coming up the River Mersey. Yeah. I mean, the place would just be absolutely packed out. Yeah. Wow, that would be amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know about his boat trip uh, in Bermuda when he, he no. sailed from... Oh, this is an incredible story. I'll just say it very briefly. He decided in, uh, I think it was 79. No, I think it was June 1980. So it was just before he came back for Double Fancy, he got like a, a hankering for, for the ocean. He had this sort of sea thing, in it, I think, in his head all his life. You well, know, his father brain. was a sailor, wasn't he? father was yeah. a sailor, grew yeah. up in, in, a, in a port city. Yeah. And what actually happened was they took a trip. I think it was Rhode Island to Bermuda, but it was a few days trip. And what actually happened was that John had learned to operate the boat to, wow. to a basic level. 
And what happened was that there was a, a huge storm and everyone got seasick except the captain and John Lennon. But the captain hadn't had any sleep for 48 hours or something. And the captain was like, I've got to go off and sleep. So John Lennon was basically in charge of this. Uh, I think it was like a schooner. It wasn't a, a big boat. And, and he, he apparently guided it through a storm for like four hours. Wow. But what I love about it is that in this book that came out last year, they're talking about John Lennon screaming to the gods. Like, <laughs> ah! <laughs> but but also singing uh, sea shanties at the top of his voice and singing Beatles songs at the top yeah, of his voice. Wow. I mean, of all the sort of John Lennon images, that that's right up well, there with my favourites. Well, I imagine love it. that coming down the Mersey. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> but just John Lennon in charge of a boat is quite comedic because yeah. thinking of John Lennon in charge of a car, you know, I'd say yeah. he was a terrible driver. So, Well, he didn't have the best eyesight, yeah. so, you know. Absolutely, yeah. 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 And originally he wouldn't wear glasses. So. yeah. I'm just thinking one of the things I didn't say is mm. my dad actually worked with Pete Best for about 25 years, you know, very close work day in, day out together, worked wow. for the um, civil service in Liverpool. That's right. Yeah. My dad worked in the employment service and so did Pete. So oh, like when, you kept that one quiet. Yeah. yeah. When the conventions <laughs> started, we used to get free tickets to the conventions off Pete. So it's strange, like my dad had his cousin who was invited to replace Pete mm. and then became really good friends with Pete. Like I say, it must have been like 25, 30 years. In fact, it was Pete Amazing. Best who took my dad on because my dad kept on showing up to the labor exchange looking for a job. And Pete wow. Best said, well, we've got some jobs here. Would you be interested? So Pete Best actually recruited my dad to his job. And then they were together oh. for about 25, 30 years. Wow. What did he say about him? I oh, really, really liked Pete Best. Liked yeah. Him, yeah. He really liked yeah. him, yeah. Pete never really talked about stuff or you know, said anything negative about anybody. But, mm. yeah, my dad really liked him. They were good friends. Have you heard of that guy called Stevie Ricks who does yes. uh, impressions? Yeah. yeah. Have, have you seen the one where uh, it's 1970 and the Beatles are broken up and they all go to the job centre and Pete Best is... Uh, oh, no, I've not seen the, that one. <laughs> yeah. Again, I'm not going to do the accent. Pete Best said, oh, you know, what do you do? And they said, <laughs> Oh, my name's Paul McCartney. I'm a, I play bass guitar, you know, and, it, and it's, uh, yeah, it's the Beatles. It's the Beatles out of work in 1970. Yeah. <laughs> Pete Best is working at the job center. Good morning. What's my name? Okay, let's get this thing started. Can I have your name, please? What's my name? That's what I'd like to know. Ah, sorry about that. Force of habit. Richard Starkey. <laughs> Peace and love. <laughs> James Paul McCartney, MBE. Dr. Winston O'Boogie and Hail Hail Rock and Roll. Right? Okay. Sir Frankie Crisp. <clears throat> and, uh, how long have you been in employment? <laughs> well, since leaving Butlins. <laughs> how long's a piece of string? You know? Um, 62 to 66, and then 67 to 70, yeah. <laughs> Too long. <laughs> okay. Um, what kind of work were you last in? I was uh, a mop top, yeah. yeah. I was in bed for a week, you know. Yap, yap, okay. I was a famous beetle. <clears throat> I was a drummer. <laughs> I used to be a drummer. You used to be. What happened? Yeah, but I got the sack. You got the what? The sack. <coughs> the sack. Ah. Sack. I was in the greatest group of all time. <coughs> so was I. <coughs> ah. Everybody thinks their band was the best, don't they? Ah. That's great. Have you got any experience? In anything else? Well, I'm an actor. I can shear a sheep or two, you know, yeah. I'm a peace activist, you know. I just think people are too aggressive, you know. Don't you, fish face? Well, you know, I'm a good chanter. Harry, Harry. <clears throat> I always funny. wonder, you know, why didn't they sort Pete out? I remember seeing an interview with McCartney, and McCartney was like, well, you know, he's got his pride. But he was there for so much of the foundation of it. You could have sorted him out, I suppose, without impacting one. his pride. I mean, that's not come from peace, obviously. It's just my take as a, you know, as a, I always thought, like, he was there. 
right up until the point where they start to get paid out. Yeah. And you wonder when they become so stratospheric, might they have just given a backhand or something, you know? Yeah, that's all getting revised as well. I mean, you mentioned Spencer Lee. I mean, this yeah. is a, lo- a long time ago. He wrote a book called Drummed Out, The Sacking of Pete Best. Okay. And it was all the different theories. And, and yeah. nobody can still quite yet decide. But have you heard of uh, David Bedford? Not, so. not the runner. No. When I met him, yeah, we were talking about that because the 118 adverts are based on the runner David Bedford. You know? Oh, I see. <laughs> yeah, I met another David Bedford. He's written a book called uh, Liddy Pool, actually. I keep meaning to read it. And he, yeah. he uncovered some stuff that apparently Ringo was the fifth person to be asked to replace Pete Best. And you mentioned the, the person yeah. you mentioned was one of the other ones. Yeah. And there's all kinds of stuff around the apparent sacking of Pete Best. And apparently he wasn't, yeah, probably shouldn't have got into this because I don't remember it well enough, but by some legal thing, they couldn't actually sack him. Okay. Uh, so he wasn't actually legally sacked. It's, it's a very complicated story, but just that there's a lot of revisionism. And um, David Bedford apparently played, I think it was a Decca audition or something, to some drummers who'd yeah. never heard it before and, and didn't know who it was. Okay. Which I suppose is possible, you know, because the Beatles were playing some stuff that they weren't known for. Apparently, he, you know, they said he was a good drummer, but... I personally, I don't know, because I, I listened to the Decca audition. I listened on headphones, and I said, right, open mind, listen to it. And there's just not enough fills going on. But then we don't know how he would have developed. That's the thing. Yeah. Very tricky. He never said oh. what happened himself. You know, he's yeah. he never, he's very discreet, you know. The thing I was getting to, yeah, I, I think there, there was a, a little bit of a callous streak because they, they obviously got Brian to get rid of him or yeah. to, to meet with him. And, um some people ascribe it to, I don't know, a certain ruthlessness that perhaps you need to get to the top. I don't know. It's, it's possible. Say, I, yeah. I always thought, even as a kid, you know, because you'd not have sorted him out. I know he got his payday in the end with the anthology, didn't yeah. he? But I think he went through some mm. struggles from what I've read, you know, up until that point. Well, not up until that point, but at an early point in his life, shortly after the Beatles really made it, you know. Yeah, when he attempted suicide, actually. Yeah, yeah. Late yeah. 60s. Yeah. I don't want to end on such a note as that. Let's... Um... <laughs> <laughs> well, I think he was, you know, I've seen a quote from Pete as well, basically saying uh, that life turned out the best way for him, you know, and he had yeah. a really good life. So that's a positive, I suppose. I think Pete was a little bit less showy than the rest of them. And so yeah. maybe in the end, the dice landed just as he needed them to. Mm. Yeah. Well, David Bedford had a good um, kind of thing he said to me. He was that rather than saying Pete or Ringo, think of the Beatles as two bands because they did change, you know, around 62, you know, when Brian came in, unfortunately we've got so little of the Beatles before. Yeah. We, there's, there's one radio show that Pete best did with them. We have heard that we've got Decker obviously, but unfortunately we haven't got much else, but of course, you know, Pete best is still around, you know, John Lennon was killed outside his house. George Harrison was almost stabbed to death inside his house. I mean, you can't ignore that. I think Pete's had a reasonably happy life. So He says so, yeah. I mean, I, mm. I've seen a quote. I think it was actually on a TED Talk where people are talking about how you change your story and stuff like that and how you, the facts of the, the, the matter don't really influence whether you've had a good life or not. And they yeah. use that quote from Pete Best about how he was really glad that he didn't end up as one of the Beatles. Yeah, so it's, a, it's go back to the Rory thing, isn't it? Perspective is everything. <clears> yeah. Know? But yeah. my dad's review on Pete is that he was a really great guy. Yeah, I don't think too many people have got a bad words to say about him, really. No. Never heard that. Yeah, it's just an interesting little link again that he's stood yeah. between these two drummers, my dad. and Yeah, just to say that, you know, the Beatles story's n- never going to die, basically, because all this new information is still being uncovered. And, and you've got the film coming out as well, haven't you? The uh, Get Back film, which will be interesting. Oh, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Did you see the trailer for that? Yeah, I saw the trailer. Yeah. yeah. I think we know what we're going to get, but I'm just going to revel in the footage. Yeah. High quality footage. I'm not going to bother. I'm not going to stress out about, oh, they're making it seem nicer because I don't really care. Yeah. I wasn't there. And uh, apparently we're going to get the full <clears throat> rooftop concert. Oh, cool. 40 minutes. Yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'll be there. <laughs> All right, Alan. Um, so can you just give us uh, your website and the podcast again? If you oh, yeah. The, um, you can get by the podcast at the website, actually. So it's liverpoolpsychotherapy.co.uk. Okay. If you forget that, you can get the podcast itself at a slice of therapy.com, maybe, or .co.uk. It's one of the two, anyway. 
But you'll find and, it at liverpoolpsychotherapy.co.uk. And it's a podcast on all the main platforms. We know yeah, you can just search for it on the main platforms as well. Yeah. yeah. The phrase nowadays is everywhere you find podcasts. Everywhere you find podcasts. Yeah. That's that's where it is. <laughs> all right. And listen, I can't thank you enough. You give oh, me two pleasure. hours of your time and we've had a nice chat and I've barely got through any of my notes as usual. So that's perfect. <laughs> Always the best conversations. So thanks a lot. Keep up the good work with the podcast and good luck with everything and stay on the line, please. All right. Cheers, Anthony. <laughs> cheers, mate. So there we have it. That was episode 68. Thanks a lot to Alan Parry for being on the show. I certainly enjoyed it. I hope he did. And I hope you did as well. Just uh, a couple of things on the clips there. Obviously, I'm sure you picked up that that Genius is Pain song was the parody. And I'll put that in the show notes. Quite funny. I just discovered it a couple of days ago. Also, the clip towards the end there of John and Paul watching Saturday Night Live. That obviously, I probably don't need to tell you, but that wasn't the real Lennon McCartney. That was from a film made in 2000 called Two of Us, which was a fictionalised account of one of John and Paul's meetings. Well, that one, of course, in 1976. That's really a great film. I'm sure I've talked about that before. And in fact, it was featured in episode 30 that I mentioned earlier, the John Lennon on film episode. And it's not particularly accurate. They take a lot of license, but I just love it. There's a great vibe around it. And the two leads portray a version of the Lennon McCartney friendship with a lot of history really well. So big recommendation. I'm pretty sure I'm going to review that in the future. I'd really like to do that. This is actually quite a unique uh, day as I'm finishing putting this show together, because in fact I've worked through my backlog. I don't have any shows pending. However, as I said in the last episode, I'd like to create a new backlog. Not too big a backlog, but uh, keep those audio questions coming, and that's going to be the next episode. The deadline for sending them in to me is next Monday, May the 31st. And uh, as I said earlier, I'm sure it's going to be a two-parter, because there's lots of questions coming in. And that's about it. So I'm going to leave you with the full version of Alan's song, John Lennon Said, and that will segue into the outro music for Glass Onion. And I'll see you very soon. Thanks a lot for listening. Take care, all the best, and goodbye. John Lennon said from his hotel bed We're all Christ inside But with Hitler too, he's inside of you It cannot be denied Cause we love the love, yet we give out hate We sing for peace and retaliate You a lover and a mother and a brother and a fighter too Jesus said from Mussolini John Lennon said, better fix your head, you know it's down to you. If you want to help, then heal yourself, but that task is never true. Cause your demons hide, but they stay inside, they find the time for the place to shine. How can you change the world if you can't change you? Like cheese.